Hello, my friendos. How is everybody doing out there tonight? <clears throat> Cookie is best at hiding. And maybe what if it is that they just didn't want to find Cookie? You know, what if that they were like, ah, I'm good. No more Cookie. I don't need to find Cookie. We can do Grim Fairy Tales. Oh, that's right. We had Grim set up tonight. Yeah, I was doing Hans Christian Andersen, but let's pull up Grimm's Fairy Tales because that's what's in the announcement. We did Grim Fairy Stories last night, so let's do that again tonight. Well, that's right. This is where we left off last time, but we have choices. Yeah, Hans are good. We'll do Hans next time. So last time, Werewolf, you were not here. Uh, we read, I'm going back to the beginning here. I wish there were an easier way. There probably is. Ah, look at us go. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, hmm. Oh boy, that's not what I wanted to do at all. Uh, no. Oh my God, I'm pressing all the wrong buttons. Are you sure? Give me a second, guys. I'm pro streamering right now. Oh, wow. This is painful. Yes, I am sure. Now let me... Wow. This has just locked up everything. Excellent. Hold, please. Well, I break the stream because I pressed the button and don't know how to unpress it. I can't see my own cursor. That's okay. Whew. Let's try again. And it'll probably bring up the same screen and I will be sad. So we'll see how it goes. We will see how this goes. Uh, okay. Please, please work again. Please no break. No break the things. Ah, so much better. Okay. Let's not, let's not press that button again. Let's not do that thing. I'll just go back up to the top. Oh, this is faster. Okay. Whew. Anyway, as I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted by my technology, which is not acting properly. We read, what all did we read last night, V? We read Little Red Cap, Bear Skin, and Snow White and Rose Red. So we have choices. We have choices this evening. Oh, let me switch over to my streaming lo-fi. So what do you guys think? What would you like to read tonight? says I have one viewer right now. I think it's a little off. What would you guys like to read? The Six Swans? One vote from Werewolf by the Six Swans. Yeah, exactly. I have at least three. I think after tonight I will be an affiliate, by the way. Okay, two votes. I only have three people that I know of, so we're going to read The Six Swans. Okay. 
Are you happy with this music or would you like suspense music? Your call. We'll stick with this for now. A king was once... Oh, wait, sorry. <clears throat> Grimm's Fairy Tales? The Six Swans. Oh, now it says we have four viewers. Woohoo! A king was once hunting in a large wood and pursued his game so hotly that none of his courtiers could follow him. But when evening approached, he stopped, looked around, and perceived that he had lost himself. He sought a path out of the woods but could not find one, and presently he saw an old woman with a nodding head who came up to him. My good woman, he said to her, can you not show me the way out of this forest? Oh yes, my lord king, she replied, I can do that very well, but upon one condition, which if you do not fulfill, you will never again get out of the wood but die of hunger. What then is this condition? asked the king. I have a daughter, said the old woman. He was beautiful as anyone you would f find in the whole wide world, the whole world, and well deserves to be your bride. Now if you make her your queen, I will show you the way out of the wood. In the anxiety of his heart, the king consented, and the old woman led him to her cottage, where the daughter was sitting by the fire. Yeah, I I don't know what that was all about. I think that was, it could have been pulled over incorrectly. She received the king as if she had expected him, and he saw at once that she was very beautiful, and yet she did not quite please him, for he could not look at her without a secret shuddering. However, he took the maiden upon his horse, and the old woman showed him the way, and the king arrived safely at his palace, where the wedding was to be celebrated. The king had been married once before and had seven children by his first wife, six boys and a girl, whom he loved above anything else in the world. He became afraid soon that the stepmother might not treat his children very well and might even do them some great injury, so he took them away to a lonely castle which stood in the midst of the forest. The castle was so entirely hidden and the way to it was so difficult to discover that he himself could not have found if it found it if a wise woman had not given him a ball of cotton which he had which had the wonderful property when he threw it before him of unrolling itself and showing him the right path the king went however so often to see his dear, ch dear children that the queen noticing his absence became inquisitive and wished to know what he went to fetch out of the forest. So she gave his servants a great, great quantity of money, and they disclosed to her the secret, and also told her of the, of the ball of cotton, which alone could show her the way. She, now, she had now no peace until she discovered where this ball was concealed, and then she made some fine silken shirts, and she had learnt of her, as she had learnt from her mother, she sewed within each a charm. One day, soon after, when the king had gone out hunting, she took the little shirts and went into the forest, and the cotton showed her the path. The children, seeing someone coming in the distance, thought it was their dear father and ran out full of joy. Then she threw over each of them a shirt that, as it touched their bodies, changed them into swans. What's wrong with this woman? Which flew away over the forest. The queen then went home quite contented and thought she was free of her stepchildren. What the little girl had not met, but the little girl had not met with her with the brothers, and the queen did not know of her. But the little girl had not met her with the brothers. That's a rough sentence. And the queen did not know of her. The following day, the king went to visit his children, but he found only the maiden. Where are your brothers? asked he. Ah, dear father, she replied. They are gone away and left me alone. And she told him how she had looked out the window and seen them change into swans, which, they, which had flown over the forest. 
Then she showed him the feathers which they had dropped in the courtyard, which she had collected together. The king was much grieved, but he did not think that his wife could have done this wicked deed. And as he feared the girl might be also stolen away, he took her with him. She was, however, so much afraid of her stepmother that she begged him not to stop more than one night in the castle. The poor maiden thought to herself, This is no longer my place. I will go and seek my brothers. And when night came, she escaped and went quite deep into the wood. She walked all night and the great part of the next day until no further from weariness she could walk. Just then she saw a rough-looking hut and going in, she found a room with six little beds, but she dared not get into one, so crept under, and laying herself on the hard earth, prepared to pass the night there. Just as the sun was setting, she heard a rustling and saw six white swans come flying in at the window. They settled on the ground and began blowing one another until they had blown all their feathers off, and their swans down slipped from them like a shirt. Then the maid knew at once that they were their brothers, and gladly she crept out from under her bed, and her brothers were not less glad to see their sister, but their joy was all of a sudden was all of a short duration. Here you must not stay, they said to her. This is a robber's hiding place. If they should return and find you here, they could murder you. Can you not protect me? inquired the sister. No, they replied for we can only lay aside our swan's feathers for a quarter of an hour each evening. And for that time we regain our human form, but afterwards we resume our changed appearance. Their sister then asked with tears, can you not be restored again? Oh no, they replied. The conditions are too difficult. For six long years you must neither speak nor laugh, and during that time you must sew together for us six little shirts of star flowers. And should there be a single word from your lips, all your labor will be in vain. Just as the brothers finished speaking, the quarter of an hour have elapsed, and they all fell out of the window again like swans. Who makes these rules? The little sister, however, made a solemn resolution to rescue her brothers, or die in the attempt. And she left the college, and penetrating deep into the forest, passed the night amid the branches of a tree. The next morning she went out and collected the star flowers to sew together. She had no one to converse with, and for laughing she had no spirits. So there upon a tree she sat, intent upon her work. Oh look, there's the goose coming in the window with the little girl hiding. After she passed some time, it happened that the king of that country was hunting in the forest. And his huntsman came beneath the tree on which the maiden sat. They called to her and asked, Who art thou? But she gave no answer. Come down to us, continued they. We will do thee no harm. She simply shook her head. And when they pressed her further with questions, she threw down to them her gold necklace, hoping therewith to satisfy them. They did not, however, leave her. And she threw down her girdle, but in vain. And even her rich dress did not make them desist. At last... The huntsman himself climbed in the tree and brought down the maiden, and they took her before the king. I guess she just naked. The king asked her, Who art thou? Who dost thou upon that tree? So now she's naked. Exactly. But she did not answer. And then he questioned her in all the languages he knew, but she remained dumb to all as a fish. Since, however, she was so beautiful, the heart king's heart was touched and he convinced he conceived for her a strong affection and he put around her his cloak and placing her before him on his horse took her to his castle there he ordered rich clothing to be made for her and although her beauty shone like sunbeams not a word escaped from her the king placed her by his side at table and there were dignified mind and manners so won upon him and he said this maiden will i marry and no other in the world. And after some days, he wedded her, because apparently you don't have to say yes to those sorts of things in these tales. You just get married for no reason, and, you know, permission is not a thing. Yeah. No, this is a different king, I'm thinking, Ezekia. She was in the woods. I suppose she could have nodded. She could have wrote some shit down. 
Oh. Now, the king had a wicked stepmother who was discontented with his marriage and spoke evil of the young queen. Who knows whence the wench comes? And she who cannot speak is not worthy of a king. A year after, when the queen brought her firstborn into the world, the old woman took him away. And when she went to the king and complained that the queen was a murderess, then she went to the king and complained that the queen was a murderess. If she didn't want to speak or communicate in a standard way, she could have bit them if she wanted to say no. I mean, that's, that's a different way of communicating. But you're a werewolf, so... I suppose we shouldn't judge. The king, however, would not believe it and suffered no one to do any injury to his wife, Crunch, who sat composedly sewing at her, her shirts and paying attention to nothing else. When a second child was born, the false stepmother used the same deceit, but the king again would not listen to her words, saying, she is too pious and good to act. Could she but speak and defend herself, her innocence would come to light. But when again the old woman stole away the third child, where is she going with these kids? Yeah, no, nope, not talking through the childbirth. That's all just fine. She's pious and too good, blah, blah, blah. But when again the woman was stole away the third child, he then accused the queen, who answered not a word to the accusation. The king was obliged to give her up to be tried. She was condemned to suffer death by fire. When, time, when the time had elapsed and the sentence was to be carried out, it happened on the very day had come round that her dear brother should be set free. The six shirts were also ready, all but the last, which yet wanted the left sleeve. As she was led to the scaffold, she placed the shirts upon her arm. And just as she mounted it, the fire was about to be kindled. She looked around and saw six swans come flying through the air. Her heart leapt for joy, and she perceived her deliverers approaching. As soon as the swans, flying toward her, alighted so near, she was enabled to throw over them the shirts. As soon as she had done, their feathers fell off, and the brothers stood up alive and well. But the youngest was without his left arm, instead of which he had a swan's wing. They embraced and kissed each other. Now the queen, going to the king, who was thunderstruck, began to say, Now may I speak, my dear husband, and prove to you that I am innocent and falsely accused. And then she told him how the wicked woman had stolen away and hidden her three children. I guess she just hid the kids. Oh, I'm going to be there. Hans. Oh, that's where Hansel and Gretel tie in. That makes sense. When she was concluded, the king was overcome with joy, and the wicked stepmother was led to the scaffold and bound to the stake and burnt to ashes. The king and queen forever lived in peace and prosperity with their six brothers. That's just it. So, no, they do not tie together to seek you. That we're, we were just making that up. Um, so, dude has got to go around the rest of his life with a swan's wing. He's just winging it. And uh, apparently, I don't know if they go back to the old, you know, father. Who knows? Tough to know. Um, but yeah, we got a burnt up stepmother and uh, dude with a wing. You know, it's all good. All right, some Grimm's fairy tales. Going back to the beginning here. Any other suggestions? Can we do the eye one, the last one? Little one eye, two eyes, and three eyes? Sure we can. This dude, all right. Little one eye, two eyes, and three eyes. Once upon a time, there was a woman. Check it out. Woman is just capitalized. She's just woman. Yeah, that's fine. Proper noun. Once upon a time, there was a woman who had three daughters, the eldest of whom was named One Eye. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that's just cracking me up. <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
the worst name ever for a kid. Who names their kid that? Who names their kid what? I, I don't know, but here we are. But here we are. Once upon a time, there was a woman who had three daughters. The, the eldest... Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. The eldest was named One Eye because she had one eye. <laughs> she had but a single eye, and that was in the middle of her forehead. The second was called Two Eyes because, like other mortals, she had two eyes. The third, Three Eyes because she had three eyes one in the center of her forehead, and two like her sister. But because her second sister had nothing out of common with her appearance, she was looked upon, down upon by her sisters and despised by her mother. You are no better than common folk. You and your freaking two eyes. They would say to her, you do not belong to us. And they would push her around and give her coarse clothing and nothing to eat but their leavings, besides numerous other insults on as occasions offered. Once it happened that two eyes had to go into the forest and tend the goat, and she went very hungry because her sisters had given her very little to eat that morning. She sat down upon the hillock and cried so much that her tears flowed almost like rivers out of her eyes, her two eyes. By and by, she looked up and saw a woman standing by who asked, Why are you weeping, two eyes? Because I have two eyes, like normal people, replied the maiden. And therefore, my mothers and sisters don't dislike me. They push me into corners and throw me their old clothes and give me nothing to eat but what they leave. Today, they've given me so little that I'm still hungry. Dry your eyes then now, said the wise woman. I will tell you something which shall prevent you from being hungry again. You must say to your goat, little kid, milk, table appear, and immediately a nicely filled table will stand before you with delicate food upon it, of which you can eat as much as you please. And as soon as you're satisfied and you're done with the table, you must say, little kid, milk, table depart, and it will disappear directly. With these words, the wise woman went away, and little two eyes thought for her to herself that she could at once she could try it at once what the woman was said were true, for she felt very hungry indeed. All right, check it out. So here's our table here with fancy ass two eyes, and we're gonna see what goes down with this. Little kid milk, table appear, said the maiden, and immediately a table covered with a white cloth stood before her with a knife and fork and a silver spoon. And the most delicate dishes were ranged in order upon it. And everything as warm as it had just been taken from the fire. Two eyes said a short grace and then began to eat. And when she had finished, she pronounced the words which the wise mother has told her. Little kid milk, table depart. And directly the table and all that was on it quickly disappeared. This is capital housekeeping, said the maiden in high glee. And at evening she went home with her goat and found an earthen ditch, dish which her sisters had left filled with their leavings. She did not touch it. And the next morning she went off again without taking the, the meager breakfast which was left out for her. The second and third time she did this, the this sisters thought nothing of it. Oh, I'm breaking my shit here. Can I turn this? Hold please. Mm, kinda. No, it goes straight again. Okay. She did not touch it. In the second morning, she went off again without taking her meager breakfast, which was left out for her. The first and second time she did this, the sisters thought nothing of it. But when she did the same thing the third morning, their attention was aroused. And they said, all is not right with two eyes, for she has left her meals twice and has not left, touched nothing of what was left for her. She must have found some other way of living. So they determined that one eye should go with the maiden when she drove the goat to the meadow and pay attention to what passed and observe whether anyone brought her or to eat or to drink. When two eyes, therefore, was about to set off, one eye said to her she was going to see whether she took proper care of the goat and fed her sufficiently.
Two Eyes, however, divined her sister's object and drove the goat where the grass was finest, then said, Come, One Eye, let us sit down and I will sing to you. So One Eye sat down and, and she was quite tired with her unusual walk in the heat of the sun. Are you awake or asleep, One Eye? Are you awake or asleep? Sang Two Eyes until her sisters really, until her sister really went to sleep. As soon as she was quite sound, the maiden had her table out and ate and drank all she needed. And by the time one eye woke again, the table disappeared. And the maiden said to her sister, come, we will go home now. While you have been sleeping, the goat has run about all over the world. So they went home and after two eyes had her meal, had left her meal untouched, the mother inquired of one eye what she had seen and she was obliged to confess that she had been asleep. The following morning, the mother told two eyes that she must go out and watch, told three eyes that she must go out and watch two eyes and see who brought her food, for it was certain that someone must. So three eyes told her sister, what, for it was certain that someone must be doing that. So three eyes told her sister that she was going to accompany her that morning to see if she took care of the goat and fed her well. But two eyes th saw through her design and drove the goat again to the best feeding place. Then her sister, then asked her sister to sit down and she would sing to her, and Three Eyes did so, for she was very tired with her long walk in the heat of the sun. Then Two Eyes began to sing as before, Are you awake, Three Eyes? But instead of continuing as she should have done, Are you asleep, Three Eyes? She said by mistake, Are you asleep, Two Eyes? And so went on singing, Are you awake, three eyes? Are you asleep, two eyes? By and by, three eyes closed two of her eyes and went to sleep with them. But the third eye, which was not spoken to, kept open. Three eyes, however, cunningly shut it too and feigned to be asleep while she was really watching. And soon two eyes, thinking all was a safe, repeated the words, Little kid milk table appear and as soon as she was satisfied with the old words little kid milk table depart three eyes watched all the proceedings and presently two eyes came awoke it and two eyes came and awoke her saying ah sister you're a good watcher but come on let's go home now when they reached home two eyes again ate nothing and her sister told her mother she knew now why the haughty hussy would not eat her vict victuals. When she's out in the meadow, said her sister, she says, little kid milk, table appear. And directly a table comes up laid with meat and wine, and everything of the best, much better than we have. And as soon as she's had enough, she says, little kid milk, table depart. And all goes away directly, as I clearly saw. Certainly she did put to sleep two of my eyes, but the one in the middle of my forehead luckily kept awake. Will you have better things than we? Cried the envious mother. Then you shall lose the chance. And so saying, she took a carving knife and killed the goat dead. As soon as two eyes saw this, she went out very sorrowfully to the old spot and sat down where she had before to weep bitterly. All at once, the wise woman stood before her, in front of her again. Why was she crying? She must not cry. Must I not cry? Replied she. When the goat, which used to furnish me every day with a dinner, according to your promise, has been killed by my mother, and I am again suffering with her thirst and hunger? Too high, said the woman. I will give you a piece of advice. Beg your sister to give you the entrails of the goat and bury them in the earth before the house door and your fortune will be made. So saying, she disappeared and two eyes went home and said to her sisters, Dear sisters, give me some of the part of the slain kid. I desire nothing else. Leave me the entrails. The sisters laughed and readily gave them to her and she buried them secretly before the threshold of the door as the wise woman had bidden her. The following morning, they found in front of the house a wonderfully beautiful tree with leaves of silver and fruits of gold hanging from the boughs. 
than which nothing more splendid could be seen in the world. But the two sisters were quite ignorant how the tree came to where it stood, but two eyes perceived it was per produced by the goat's entrails, for it stood on the exact spot where she buried them. As soon as her mother saw it, she took one eye to break off some of the fruit. One eye went up the tree and pulled the bough toward her to pluck the fruit, but the bough flew back and again out of her hands, and so did so every time she took a hold of it, till she was forced to give up, for she could not obtain a single golden apple in spite of her endeavors. Then the mother said to Three Eyes, Do you climb up, for you can see better with your three eyes than your sister with her one. Three Eyes, however, was not more fortunate than her sister, for the golden apples flew back as soon as she touched them. At last the mother got so impatient that she climbed the tree herself, but she melt with no more success than either of her daughters, and grasped the air when she thought she had the fruit. Two Eyes now thought she would try and said to her sisters, let me get up, perhaps I will be successful. Oh, you're very likely indeed, said they, with your two eyes, you will see well, no doubt. So two eyes climbed the tree, and directly she touched the boughs, and golden apples fell into her hands, so that she plucked them as fast as she could and filled her apron before she went down. The mother took them of her, but returned her no thanks. And the two sisters, instead of treating two eyes better than they had done before, were more envious of her because she alone could gather the fruit. In fact, they treated her worse. One morning, not long after the springing up of the apple tree, the three sisters were sit standing together beneath it, when in the distance a young knight was seen riding towards them. Make haste, two eyes, explained the two elder sisters. Make haste and creep out of our way so that we may not be ashamed of you. And so saying, they put her in great haste in an empty cast which stood near, in which covered the golden apples as well, which she had been plucking. Soon the knight came up to the tree, and her sister saw a very handsome man, for he stopped to admire the fine silver leaves and golden fruit, and presently asked to whom the tree belonged, for he should like to have a branch of it. One eye and three eyes replied that the tree belonged to them, and they tried to pluck a branch for the night. They had all their trouble for nothing, however, for their boughs and fruit flew back as soon as she touched them. This is very wonderful, cried the knight, that this tree should belong to you, and yet you could not pluck the fruit. The sisters, however, maintained that it was theirs, but while they spoke, two eyes rolled a golden apple from underneath the cask so that it traveled to the feet of the knight, for she was angry because her sisters had not spoken the truth. And when he saw the apple, he was astonished and asked where it came from. And one eye and three eyes said that they had another sister, but they dared not let her to be seen because she had only two eyes like common folk. The knight, however, would see her and called two eyes, come here. And soon she made an appearance. She made it in her appearance from under the cask. The knight was bewildered at her great beauty and said, you two eyes can surely break off a bough for this tree for me? Yes, she replied, that I will, for it is my property. And climbing up, she easily broke off a branch with silver leaves and golden fruit, which she handed to the knight. What can I give you in return, two eyes? asked the knight. Alas, if you'll take me with you, I shall be happy. For now I suffer hunger and thirst, and in trouble and grief from the early morning to the late evening. Take me and save me. Thereupon the knight raised two eyes upon his saddle, and took her home to his father's castle. There he gave her beautiful clothes and all she wished to eat and drink. And afterward, because his love for her had become so great, he married her in a very wed happy wedding they had. Her two sisters, meanwhile, were very jealous when Two Eyes was carried off by the knight, but they consoled themselves saying, the wonderful tree remains still for us. And even if we could not get the fruit, everybody that passes will stop and look at it and then come to praise it to us. Who knows where our wheat may bloom? The morning after this speech, however, the tree disappeared, and with all their hopes. But when two eyes that same day looked out of her chamber window, behold, the tree stood before it, and there remained. For a long time after this occurrence, two eyes lived in the enjoyment of the greatest happiness, and one morning two poor women came to the palace and beat and be and begged in alms. Two eyes, after looking narrowly at their faces, recognized her two sisters. 
one eye and three eyes, who had come to such great poverty that they were forced to wander about, begging their bread from day to day. Two eyes, however, bade them welcome, invited them in, and took care of them, till both repented of their evil, which they had done to their, her sister in the days of their childhood. All right, I think we have time for one more. Let's go back to the beginning here. Because they're old sisters. I have no idea why they look so old and she's so young. I think she was the youngest sister though, right? All right, everybody. One last one to pick. Salty, if you're out there, you can pick one. You might have gone to sleep. Oh yeah, Salty's probably asleep, I know. Oops. Jeez. <laughs> I'm not sure what she used. Yeah, we're. I'm still tuning that in, Werewolf. Sorry. <laughs> Streamlabs did not like my swear. No. I know. I haven't figured out which one is. it's dialing in on. It shouldn't be catching any of those, but... At some point, it does. So, I'll figure it out. The tailor? Okay. Where is the tailor? Where are you seeing a tailor, V? Am I crazy? The valiant little tailor? Ah! Got it. Thank you. Don't know how I was missing that, but I was. Thank you. All right, last one for the night, y'all. Get your warm milk around. Get in bed. Pull the covers up. Um. Oh, yeah. Well, we should be allowing. And I don't know why it doesn't allow me to allow words. So I, I got to figure that out. I'll figure that one out. And I don't know which one is catching it. It might, if it's Cloudbot or Twitch. Yeah, I know, but it's not giving me the option, Isiki. I'm not sure what the story is. Uh, let me check moderator mode over here. It's Cloudbot? Okay. You know, I should be able to look at Cloudbot right now. Okay, it's definitely Cloudbot. Y'all are saying, let's pop out this window. Let's do a little bit of work while we're here. Cloudbot. Commands, timers, mod tools. Word protection. Oh, there we go. Preferences. Auto permit none. See, it's not using a default blacklist. Oh, there it is. Delete. Confirm. All right. You can now say... Try it now. Uh, hold, on, hold, on, hold on. Let's save. Try it and... Yes! We're good. Aha! You can say it all you want now. All caps and everything. All right. Last one for the evening. Climb in bed. Is Nickel sleeping yet, uh, V? Pat Nickel's head. Get your warm milk and whatever you drink before you go to bed. I am out of cider, which makes me very sad. He's snoring. Oh, he doesn't need a bedtime story. He's all set. Hold on, I'm still... Eh. Let go. Give me some more, Kate. Ugh, I'll have to fix that after the stream. Still working on my sibilance. It's a little... It's a little bit crazy. It's not too bad. If you can still hear me, Salty, sleep well. I'll get to see you tomorrow. I love you very much. 
the valiant little tailor. One fine day, a ta tailor was sitting on his bench by the window in a very high in very high spirits, sewing away and diligently and presently. Up the street came a country woman crying, "Good jams for sale! Good jams for sale!" This cry sounded nice in the tailor's ears, and poking his diminutive head out of the window, he called, "Here, my good woman!" Just bring your jams in here. The woman mounted up the three steps to the tailor's house with her large basket and began to open all the pots together before him. He looked at them, held them up to the light, smelt them, and at last said, These jams seem to be very nice. So you may weigh me out two ounces, my good woman. I don't object even if you make it a quarter of a pound. The woman who hoped to have met with a very good customer gave him all he wished and went off grumbling in a very good temper, in a very bad temper. Now, exclaimed the tailor, heaven will send me a blessing on this jam and give me fresh strength and vigor. And taking the loaf, taking the bread from the cupboard, he cut himself a slice the size of the whole loaf and spread the jam upon it. That will taste very nice, said he. But before I take a bite, I must finish this waistcoat. So he put the bread on the table and stitched away, making larger and larger stitches every time for joy. Meanwhile, the smell of the jam rose to the ceiling where many flies were sitting and enticed them down. And soon there was a great swarm of them that pitched upon the bread. Hello, who asked you? exclaimed the tailor, driving away the uninvited visitors. But the flies, not understanding his words, would not be driven off and they came back in greater numbers than before. This put the little man in, in a great passion, and snatching up his anger, a bag of cloth, he brought it down with a merciless swoop upon them, and he raised it again and counted as many seven lying dead before him with his outstretched hands. What a fellow you are, said he to himself, astonished by his own bravery. The whole town must hear of this. And in great haste, he cut himself out a band, hemmed it, and put on large letters, seven and one blow. Ah, said he, not one city alone, the whole world shall hear it. And his heart danced with joy like a puppy dog's tail. The little tailor bound the belt around his body and made ready to travel forth into the wide world, feeling the workshop too small for his great deeds. Before he set out, however, he looked around his house to see if there was anything he should carry with him, but found only an old cheese, which he pocketed, and observed a bird, which was caught in the bushes before the door. He captured it, put that in his pocket too. Soon after, he set out boldly on his travels. He was light and active. He felt no fatigue. His road led up a hill, and then he arrived at the highest point, which he found a great giant sitting there, who is gazing about him very composedly. But the little tailor went boldly up. Good day, friend. Truly you sit there and seek the whole world stretched below you. I am on, I also am on my way thither to seek my fortune. Are you willing to go with me? The giant looked with scorn at the little tailor. You rascal, you wretched creature. Perhaps so, said the tailor. But here may be seen what sort of man I am. And unbuttoning his coat, he showed the giant his belt. The giant read, Seven at one blow. And supposing they were men whom the tailor had killed, he felt some respect for him. Still, he meant to try him first. So taking up a pebble, he squeezed it so hard that water dropped out of it. Do that as well, he said to the other, if you have the strength. If it be nothing harder than that, said the tailor, that's child's play. And diving in his pocket, he pulled out the cheese and squeezed it until the whey ran out and said, Now, I fancy that I could have done better than you. The giant wondered to what to say, for he could not believe of the little man. And so catching up another pebble, he flung it so high, and when it went out of sight, he said, There, you little pygmy. Do that if you can, you little pygmy. Well done, said the tailor, but your pebble will fall down again to the ground. I will throw one up and it will not come down. 
And dipping into his pocket, he took out the bird and threw it in the air. The bird, glad to be flee, free, flew straight up and then far away and did not come back. How does that little performance please you, friend? Asked the tailor. You can throw well, replied the giant. Now truly, we will see if you are able to carry something uncommon. So he took out a large oak tree, which lay upon the ground. If you're strong enough, now help me carry this tree out of the forest. With pleasure, replied the tailor. But you may hold up the trunk on your shoulder, and I will lift the boughs and branches. They're the heaviest, and I'll carry them. The giant took the trunk upon his shoulder, and then the tailor sat down on one of the branches. And the giant, who could not look around, was compelled to carry the whole tree and the tailor also. He being behind, he was very che cheerful and laughed at the trick, and presently began to sing the song. There rode three tailors out at the gate, as if the carrying of the tree were a trifle. The giant, after he had staggered a very short distance with a heavy load, could go no further, and called out, Do you hear? I must drop the tree. The tailor, jumping down, quickly embraced the tree with both arms as if he'd been carrying it, and said to the giant, Are you such a big fellow you cannot carry a tree by yourself? Then they traveled on further, and then they came to a cherry tree. The giant seized up the top of the tree where the ripest cherries hung, bending it down, gave it to the tailor to hold, telling him to eat. But the tailor was far too weak to hold down the tree. When the giant let go, the tree flew up in the air, and the tailor was taken with it. He came down on the other side, however, unhurt, and the giant said, What does that mean? Are you not strong enough to hold that twig? My strength did not fail me, said the tailor. Do you imagine that it was a hard task for one who was slain seven at one blow? I sprang up over the tree because the hunters were shooting down here in the thicket. Jump after me if you can. The giant made the attempt but could not clear the tree and got stuck fast in the branches. So that in, in this affair too, the tailor had the advantage. Then the giant said, since you are such a stray, such a brave fellow, come with me to my house and stop a night with me. The tailor agreed and followed him. And when they came to a cave, they sat by the fire with two other giants, each with a roast sheep in his hand from which he was eating. The tailor sat down thinking, ah, this is very much more like the world than is my workshop. As soon the giant pointed out the bed where he would lie down and go to sleep. The bed, however, was way too large, so he crept out of it and lay down in a corner. When midnight came and the giant fancied the tailor would be in a sound sleep, he got up, taking a heavy iron bar, and beat the bed right through with one stroke. He believed he had thereby given the tailor his death blow. At the dawn of the day, the giants went out in the forest, quite forgetting the tailor, and presently he came quite cheerfully and showed himself before them. The giants were frightened and dreaded he might kill them, and they ran away in a great hurry. The tailor traveled on, always following in his nose, and after he had journeyed some long distance, he came to a cart courtyard of a royal palace. And feeling very tired, he laid himself down on the ground and went to sleep. While he, he lay, the people came and viewed him on all sides and read upon his belt, Seven at one blow. Ah, they said, what is this great warrior? Why is this great warrior here in a time of peace? This must be some valiant hero. So they went and told the king, knowing that should war break out, here was a valuable and useful man, whom one ought to not part with at any price. The king took his advice, sent one of his courtiers out to the tailor to beg for his fighting services, if she should, if he should ever be awaked. The messenger stopped at the sleeper's side and waited till he stretched out his limbs and unclosed his eyes. And then he messaged, mentioned to him his message. Solely for that reason did I come here, was his answer. I'm quite willing to enter into the king's service. Then he was taken away with great honor and a fine house was appointed for him to dwell in. The courtiers, however, became jealous of the tailor, wished him at the other end of the world, what will happen, said they to one another. If we go to war with him and he strikes out seven, we'll fall in one stroke and nothing will be left for us to do. In their anger, they came to the determination to, res to resign. And they all went to the king 
and asked his permission, saying, we are not prepared to accompany a man who kills seven at one blow. The king was sorry to lose all his devoted servants for the sake of one and wished that he had not ever seen the tailor and would gladly now to be rid of him. He dared not, however, dismiss him because he feared the tailor might kill him and all his subjects and seat himself on the throne. For a long time he deliberated, till finally he came to the decision. And sending for the tailor, he told him that seeing he was such a great hero, he wished to beg a favor of him. In a certain forest in my kingdom, said the king, there are two giants who by murder, rapine, fire, and robbery have committed great damage, and no one approaches them without endangering his life. If you overcome and slay these giants, I shall give you my only daughter in marriage and half of my kingdom for a dowry. A hundred knights shall accompany you too in order to render you an assistance. Ah, this is something for a man like me, thought the tailor to himself. A lovely princess and half the kingdom are not offered to one every day. Oh yes, he replied, I shall soon settle these two giants and a hundred horsemen are not needed for that purpose. He who kills seven at one blow has no fear of two. Speaking thus, the little tailor set out, followed by a hundred knights, to whom he said, immediately they come to the edge of the, for whom, to whom, well, let me back up. Speaking thus, the little tailor set out, followed by a hundred knights, to whom he said, immediately they came to one edge of the forest, you must stay here. I prefer to meet these giants alone. Then he ran off into the forest, peering about him on all sides. And after a while, he saw the two giants sound asleep under a tree, snoring so loudly that the branches above them shook violently. The tailor, bold as a lion, filled both his pockets with stones and climbed up the tree. When he got to the middle of it, he crawled along a bough so that he sat above the sleepers and then let fall one stone upon the other upon the body of one of them. For some time the giant did not move, until at last awakening he pushed his companion and said, Why are you hitting me? You must have been dreaming, he answered. I didn't touch you. So they laid themselves down to sleep, and presently the tailor threw a stone down upon the other. What is that? Why are you knocking me about? I did not touch you. You were dreaming, said the first. So they argued for a few minutes, but both being very weary with the day's work, they soon went to sleep again. The tailor had began his fun again, and picking out the largest stone, threw it with all his strength upon the chest of the first giant. This is too bad, he exclaimed, and jumping up like a madman, he fell upon his companion, who considered himself equally injured. And they set to it in such an earnest that they rooted up trees and beat one another until they both fell dead upon the ground. Then the tailor jumped down, saying, what a piece of luck. They didn't have to pull up the tree which I was sat in, or else I'd have to jump to another like a squirrel, for I'm not used to flying. Then he drew his sword, cutting a deep wound in the breast of both, and then he went to the horseman and said, The deed is done. I have given each his death stroke. But it was a tough job, for in their defense they uprooted trees to protect themselves. Still, it is all new, no use when such one as I come who slew seven at one stroke. Are you not wounded, they asked? How can you ask me that? They have not injured a hair upon my head, replied the little man. The knights could hardly believe him, till riding in the forest they found the giants laying dead and the uprooted trees around him. Then the tailor demanded the promised reward of the king, but he repented of his promise, began to think of some new plan to shake off the hero. Before you receive my daughter and half my kingdom, said he to him, you must execute another brave deed. And in the forest, there lies a unicorn that creates great damage. You must first catch him. A unicorn that creates damage? That seems outlandish. I fear a unicorn less than I did two giants. Seven at one blow is my motto, said the tailor. So he carried with him a rope and an ax and went off to the forest ordering those who were told to accompany him to wait on the outskirts. He did not have to hunt long for the unicorn approached and prepared to rush at him and would pierce him on the spot. Steady, steady, he exclaimed. That is not done so easily. And waiting till the animal was close upon him, he sprang nimbly behind a tree. The unicorn rushing with all its force 
against the tree, stuck its horn so fast in the trunk that it could not pull it out again. And so it remained prisoner. Now I've got him, said the tailor, coming from behind the tree. He bound the rope around his neck, and then cutting the horn out of the tree with his axe, he arranged everything, and leading the unicorn, brought it before the king. The king, however, would not yet deliver the, over the promised reward, and made a third demand, that before the marriage, the tailor should capture a wild boar, which did much damage, and he should have the huntsman to help him. With pleasure, was the reply. It is a mere nothing. The huntsman, however, he left behind to their great joy, for this wild boar had already so hu often hunted them that they saw no fun in now hunting it. As soon as the boar perceived the, the tailor, it ran at him with gaping mouth and glistening teeth and tried to throw him down on the ground. But our flying hero sprang into a little chapel which stood near and out again at the window and on the other side in a moment. The boar ran after him, but he, skipping around, closed the door behind it, and there was a furious beast was caught, for it was much too unwieldy and heavy to jump out the window. Now the tailor now ordered his huntsmen up, so they might see the prisoner with their own eyes, but our hero presented himself before the king, who was obliged at last, whether he would or not, to keep his word and surrender his daughter in half the kingdom. If he had known it was no warrior, but only a tailor who stood before him, it would have grieved him still more. So the wedding was celebrated with great magnificence, though with a little rejoicing, and out of the tailor there was made a king. A short time afterwards, the young queen, hearing, heard her husband talking in his sleep, saying, Boy, make me a coat, and then stitch up these trousers, or I will lay a yard measure over your shoulders. Then she understood what condition her husband was, and complained in the morning to her father, and begged that he would free her from her husband, who was nothing more than a tailor. The king confronted her and said, This night leave your chamber door open. My servants shall stand outside. And when he is asleep, they shall come in, bind him, and carrying him away to a ship, which shall take him out into the wide world. The wife was pleased with the proposal. But the king's armor bearer, who had overheard it all, went to the young king and revealed the whole plot. I will soon put an end to this affair, said the valiant little tailor. In the evening, at their usual time, they went to bed and the wife thought he slept. She got up, opened the door, and she laid herself down again. The tailor, however, only pretended to be asleep, and began to call out in a loud voice, Boy, make me a coat, and then stitch up these trousers, or I will lay the yard measure about your shoulders. Seven have I slain with one blow, two giants have I killed, a unicorn I have led captive, and a wild boar have I caught, and shall I be afraid of those who stand out my, beside my room? When the men heard these words spoken by the tailor, a great fear came over them, and they ran away as if wild huntsmen were following them. Neither afterwards did the, any men venture to oppose him. Thus the tailor became a king, and so he lived out the rest of his life. And there it is. A Few of Grimm's Fairy Stories by Jacob Grimm, William Grimm. You can find all these things on Project Gutenberg if you so desire such a thing. I did figure out transitions. So as you guys can see, I have a my transitions now move around like this, which is kind of nice. I think it looks okay. I don't know, though. I might choose a different transition. Maybe, yeah, it's very fancy. I'm very fancy. I think I liked, let's try this one. I kind of like the fading a little bit. Let's try that for a while. We'll see how those go. All right, kids, let's look for somebody to raid. I think... The other kids are still playing games, so we'll raid into one of them. Yeah, Big Jim is there, so let me raid into Big Jim. And I will see you all probably after the weekend. I'm, we'll be um, streaming next Tuesday, faux show. 
um, faux show. And we'll be doing the last part of um, the last part of uh, the Headless Horseman. Um, and we will be building D&D characters. So come back next week and help me uh, with NPCs. We've got a couple of NPCs left. And then, of course, the monster of the Headless Horseman. So that should be fun. We'll do that. And if we get some more reading, we'll probably do a bedtime reading or something like that. So I will see you guys next Tuesday, maybe next Monday or even Sunday night. Salty and I are celebrating this weekend. So I'll be off and around and uh, living my best life. So thank you guys all so much uh, for being here. Let's raid over to Big Jim Slay Gaming. Only three V. All right. We're going to raid over into Big Jim Slade in just a few seconds. And I will see you all soon and for sure next Tuesday. Love, peace, and hair grease, kids. Sleep well.